Hello and welcome to the show. My guest today is a renowned historian and journalist who most probably knows more about the German capital Berlin than many Germans. He certainly knows more about the Reichstag building, which is now once again the home of the German parliament. He's published extensively on the subject. Michael Cullen is also a translator and interpreter, and he's lived here, I've worked this out, I think you've lived here longer than any other guest we've had on the programme. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you very In much. In fact, if I've got my math right, it's your 50th anniversary of living in Berlin. That's, this year. You've done it well. Yeah. 50 years. Yeah. yeah. And I must ask you initially, what was it like in 1964? If we bear in mind that in 1964, Nelson Mandela was sentenced to life imprisonment and then went to jail for 26 years. It was also the year the Beatles played the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, this is a long time. So. Tell us, what was it like, a young American arriving in Berlin? Well, I was here because I was giving some lectures and I was just then teaching English, American English. And uh, the city was, there were a lot of ruins still around. The Kofferstendamm didn't have any high rises. There was nothing like that, not even the Europa Center, which is 20 stories high, was, it was under construction at the time. So these things were not there. Uh, there, were, there were trams running through the streets uh, in West Berlin. Um, there were many streets which still had cobblestones. Um, and uh, there were telephone booths, uh, telephone boxes, the British would call them, all over the place to make telephone calls. And you needed 20 pfennigs to make a telephone call. And it wasn't very easy. And nowadays, 50 years later, we all have cell phones or portables. So life was very, very different. Yeah. Um, and what actually brought you here? Because you were a student of Russian language and literature, mm -hmm. but you came to Germany, to Hanover, I believe. First to Munich. Uh -huh. And I worked at Radio Liberty there for seven months as an intern. Oh. Because of my Russian speaking abilities. I had studied Russian in college. And then I um, got a scholarship to the US, to a college there, to Columbia University, to do a master's, came back to Germany after not finishing my master's as a teacher of English in Hanover in a middle school. And then when Kennedy was assassinated, that was in November 63, I wanted to see Berlin, which had reacted so uh, emotionally to the assassination. And a friend of mine got me some uh, lecture gigs here in Berlin. And uh, so I came to Berlin in January of 64 for the first time and uh, gave some lectures. And uh, that's when uh, I was asked then to come to Berlin again to teach for a second year, this time in a, uh, in a regular gymnasium, uh, which I did then starting in June of 64. And what got to you about Berlin that made you this, this the city for you? Well, for the while, it wasn't, it was strange, but it was one of the things that I really love about Berlin and still do is the musical life. I'm a very great fan of classical music and I loved the offer that was here to go to anything yeah. and it was very cheap and you could go to the opera, you can go to the Philharmonie. That, that en enjo I was enjoying that a lot. And of course, I was on my own for the really first time after college. Uh, and I was enjoying life thoroughly. And I had an art gallery, which uh, let me meet a lot of people, young people. Yeah, I mean, we've got a picture you send us. Here you are, as a young man at the art gallery. I mean, how did you set up an art gallery in what was then, of course, the divided Berlin? It, um, was, a, it was a lark. It was, the Germans would call it a schnapsy day. It was just sort of a, why not? I mean, I, was, I had a lot of time on my hands. I was teaching only 12 hours a week at the school. So what, I'm, what am I going to do with my time? And I thought of about a, a bookshop and I thought about concerts. But an art gallery seemed the safest and easiest thing to do. A friend of mine, a <laughs> British fellow, who was also a teacher, Robin Davis, who is no longer alive, I'm sorry to say, uh, helped me. And uh, we set up the gallery in the Wedding District, which is the working district of Berlin. Uh, working district, yes. And uh, we, uh, 
and we just had a great time. Mm. It was very easy. We should explain, of course, this was the time when the, the city was divided by the Berlin Wall surrounding it and going through the middle of it. Yes. Um, I mean, it had just been up three, three, years, years, three years then. That's so right. uh, did you go across to the east? I mean, presumably you went to the opera. Well, I went to the opera, I went to the Brecht Ensemble, the Berlin Ensemble, I went to the theatre. I did that every once in a while. Uh, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't impossible. I mean, it was border checks and exchanging money and surly border guards. But uh, I, w I felt safe. I wasn't doing anything illegal. I was within the law and uh, I had an American passport, which was very helpful. Uh, it protected me a lot more than it might do today. And uh, it was fine. And I got to see Berlin, a lot of Berlin. Mm. I mean, I had a little car, a little Isetta, with a door which opens up in the front. Ah. Uh, <laughs> the Germans call it an asphalt bubble yeah. um, because it, it's hardly distinguishable from anything else. It's, but I, it got me around town and uh, I loved it and I had a good time. Mo moving, I, know this, I think this is moving on to the next decade, but <laughs> now this is, you gave us, this is a picture of your wedding, I believe, and this uh, was in Poland. That's in Breslau, or the Poland's call it Wroclaw, and there I am, sitting to the left of me is my former wife. We divorced happily after uh, eight years, seven years, and uh, we, yes, we, that was in January of 78. It was very, very... Tricky, very difficult, and in a certain way, very adventurous. Uh, a but lot don't of my you friends have came. Polish antecedents. My father and my mother both were born in what is now Poland. Oh, well, actually, my father was born in what is now White Russia, Belarus. Uh -huh. But um, they came as young children to the United States, and uh, I had no really Polish connections. Oh, okay, okay. Nothing. I mean, I was not a. I wasn't in love with Poland, I didn't hate Poland. It was, for me, a, a foreign country, and I hadn't been there until I had met um, Elzbieter. Okay. Let's find out some more about our guest. Our reporter, Maximilian von Beimer, visited him at home the other day. I'm at the computer basically by 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And if nothing stops me, I can be working here until 8 o'clock at night. And I don't know why people do these things, because it's so much work. On the other hand, it's so rewarding. Here are some more photographs, maybe. So it's here. Oh my goodness. Here I am with Christo and Jean-Claude and Mr. Stücke. Berlin has changed so much from the time this book was done, which is now 25 years ago, before the fall of the wall. I thought about reasons for wanting to wrap the Reichstag. And mostly I wanted to have an engagement between art and politics. The Germans call that a schnapsy day. I mean, it comes, supposedly when you're drunk, you think of the craziest things. This is a picture I've never seen. I will make sure to get myself a good copy of it. This is the only monument I know of in which the descendants of the perpetrators of a terrible event uh, took the trouble to create something to show that they are sorry that this happened.
And he's here in the studio with me, Michael Callan, who is the man I hadn't mentioned before, responsible for getting Christo and Jean-Claude to wrap the rice talc um, nearly 20 years ago now. So before we talk about that, I would like to talk about um, where you were at the end there, at the Holocaust Memorial. Yes. Um, which finally opened in 2005 after years of, of intense debate, of which you were a part of. Mm -hmm. And I believe, were you against that particular version of the memorial? Not really. I was against the site originally. I was against the fact that it was only for the murdered Jews of Europe and not for the other, what I, whom I, who I call innocent victims, the people who were born a victim the, the moment they take their first breath, the, the, the homosexuals. Sinti uh, and the Roma. Sinti and the Roma. They do now have they, a memorial. They do now have a memorial, but at the time there wasn't one prepared or in the pipeline for them. And I wanted one which included all the innocent victims, not the ones who changed their minds politically. There was a, that's an, and a, an adult event, but when you are born and you become a victim the very <coughs> moment you're born, that's the kind of victim I wanted to have a monument for. Are you happy with it now? I'm not happy with it, but I don't, uh, I don't, I'm happy with a part of it which is you didn't show or has, people haven't seen, that's downstairs. Uh, there's a huge exhibition about... Mm, it's an extraordinary course. exhibition. It's extraordinarily yeah. well done. And that's something which I recommend heavily to anybody visiting Berlin, not just to see upstairs, but to go downstairs and go to the exhibition. You will learn a lot. Yeah, I, I, I must say I was very moved. And, and actually, I didn't like the stones that we saw there. But after being to the exhibition and coming up and walking through them, I was actually so very we're, moved. We're on the same page. Yeah. Um, the Reichstag. Yes. The story goes, in 1971, you sent a postcard to Christo and Jean-Claude, the artists that, who are famous for wrapping things, if you like, saying, why don't you wrap the Reichstag? It then took 24 years, yeah? Yeah. It's so far, the story's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 I believe also probably. I mean, he Christo wanted to do this, but I believe, and we have a picture from you. We should just show the rice tile building again. Yes, and with him in front of it. Now, where you got him here, which I believe was quite difficult, because I heard that he didn't want to fly here because he didn't want to fly over East Germany. That's right. Christo was a refugee from Bulgaria who had jumped the border from Prague to. Vienna in 1957, oh. and uh, they were treating his parents and his brothers uh, very badly, and he was afraid, and he was, a, he was not yet a citizen of the United States. In 1972, he was still not a citizen. He didn't become a citizen until, I think, 75. And that meant that he was, a, he had a, one, of these, one of these transient passports, and he thought if the plane got shot down over East Germany, they would take him and bring him back to Bulgaria and set him up against the wall. At any rate, he was afraid. And we only convinced him in late 75 to come here in early 76. And that photograph was taken mm. uh, just in February of 76, the first time we had actually seen the Reichstag one-on-one. Mm. -on -one. Well, I, I wonder what, before all this happened, what, what made you sort of sit there and think, that building, <laughs> the rice tank, we sh it should be wrapped by well, Christo and Jean-Claude. I, mean. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't passionate about it. It was just a matter of, why not? I mean, one of, these, one of the things that happens in life is that you could try to do something and there's nothing opposing you, nothing opposing the idea, and you try it. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I imagine that a lot of the experiments in electricity and chemistry have been done the same way by people just trying it and seeing if it works, trial and error. And this is an attempt to do something, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I didn't think it would work. I didn't think it wouldn't work. I just didn't know what would happen. I just sent him a postcard, and uh, it worked. Uh, but it was well, really- Well, it, it worked in that he came, obviously. To, yes. And, and, and the ball started rolling. I mean, another picture of, of you 
uh, on the left. Yes, and that's um, Karl Ruhrberg yes, and Christo. And, and I believe the Bundes president, the president. Bundestag's president, the speaker of ah. the, the the speaker of the house, Karl Carstens. Then, that yeah. was in March of '77. Christo and I and Karl Ruhrberg, who was head of the Kunsthalle in Düsseldorf, are explaining to the president of the Bundestag, the person who has to actually, or we thought, had to give permission. Yeah. Uh, what, so they were interested. They, they were did interested. show an interest. They they didn't refuse to see us. Uh, we didn't come along as as, as 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 poor petitioners. We came along with a good idea, and we came along with a lot of very very good help. Uh, very important people in Germany supported us and uh, sent letters, and so we were we gained entrance to the to the inner sanctum of of the Bundestag. And for many years, and we were doing that all the time. But in the end, Carson's turned us down, but uh, we didn't uh, let ourselves get discouraged, and we just moved on, and we pressed on, and we, we went through several Bundestag presidents. The Speaker of the House is, is the American or German, or the British title, the President of the Parliament, and um, we finally made it in... Uh, in 91. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I suppose the fall of the wall in 1989 helped. We should explain the Rice House right on the, what was the divide. Right, between... well, actually, part of the masonry of the Rice Tag was in East Berlin. Yes, the back, yeah, uh, sort the of the back, back of it. Yeah. The back of the, the east side of it, uh, the east facade. And But that didn't stop us at all, although was, there were some people who thought that if Christo were to wrap the Reichstag, some of the material would flow into East Berlin and cause a, an international ruckus. Mm. Uh, nothing like that was uh, in any way involved. But um, the Reichstag was there and it was doing nothing. It was- yeah, it was empty. It was basically empty. It mm. was used as an office space for Ger Berlin members of the Bundestag who didn't That's have right. a vote in the Bundestag in Bonn. So they, but they had their offices in that building to give it some kind of semblance of, of a function. For but those who really... are a bit younger than us, we should explain, Bonn was then the capital of well, West Germany. It's, that's it's, right. It's quite complicated, really, but not really. It's not really complicated. No, no. We, we went through it, but of course, it's, for many people, it's now history, and uh, some people didn't live there. When did you know it's going to happen? I mean, is this 24 years It's a years good question, time? and it's a really, it's a very, it's a, the answer is probably very unexpected. We knew in September 93 that we would get permission. September 93, Christo and I and our team were in Wuppertal, which is down the road, about 400 kilometers, giving, Christo was lecturing there, and I was outside listening to a portable radio of the ceremony to decide which city would get the Olympic Games for 2000, and that was from Monte Carlo. And as Mr. Samaranch pulled the name of Sydney out of the envelope, and Christo and I smiled, and he said, the Reichstag will be wrapped. Because we knew Berlin had nothing else in its, uh, no plan B to make the city more attractive than the Esther, so we knew right away, and three weeks later, the mayor of Berlin came on board and said, yeah, I'm for the wrapping of the Reichstag. So we knew at that moment that we would probably get our dream, see our dream come true. At that very, very, very strange, but you didn't ask me that question at any other time, and yeah. that's, that's the wow. real answer. All right, yeah. great. Now, for those who perhaps don't know, <laughs> about this extraordinary event, and I met a young girl in the makeup before who doesn't know about it, which is fair enough, you know. Yep. And for those who remember it too, let's have a look back at some archive footage from 1995 at the Reichstag in the centre of this city, Berlin, right where the border had been between the East and the West, literally this building being wrapped up like a candy. Five o'clock on a Monday morning at the Reichstag. Early risers and photographers were on hand to witness the big moment when the first section of cloth would begin to be lowered. A symbol of German history was being wrapped. Around half past seven, the front of the building had vanished behind the silvery cloth.
weather conditions were now perfect. A day earlier, the wrapping had been put on hold due to high winds, but still visitors kept coming in droves. This is something extraordinary. It'll only happen once in my lifetime, so I'm having a look. The artists who conceived the wrapping of the Reichstag, Christo and Jean-Claude, employed over 2,000 helpers for their project. Among them, 90 mountain climbers and 120 installation workers to unroll the cloth. Members of the German Alpine Club were proud to be on board. The most exciting thing is the surroundings here. Considering the history of the building and Christo's endeavor to wrap the Reichstag, I get goosebumps, and it makes you really want to be part of it. An astounding 100,000 square meters of aluminum-coated polymer fabric was used in this unique art project. Twice the surface area of the whole building. The artists chose the silvery color for good reason. In Berlin, even in summertime, you can have a gray day by having the fabric uh, very reflective. Uh, we hope to show the volume of the building even in the gray day because the contrast between shed and light is much bigger. More than 15 kilometers of blue polypropylene rope were needed to hold the material in place. The 32 millimeter thick cord secured a formidable 60 tons of fabric. We do not wrap the rice stack simply. We created new form. We spent 200 tons of steel to shaping new form and to create a new architecture in the rice stack by taking all these Victorian elements and ornaments, hiding these elements and building completely new proportion and shaping the rice stack and new vision. That new vision led many Germans to reappraise the building and its history. Over the two weeks it remained in place, some five million people came to see the transformed Reichstag. A stunning work of art, making a summer to remember. And I have my very own piece, which I didn't cut out of the artwork. You could get these at the Reichstag at the time, which is a piece of the material that's shiny on this side. As we saw there in that last picture, in the evening, it looked really quite beautiful. Well, it reflects it? all the different light yeah. of the, what, what the sky is giving. It's, a, it's like a mirror. Yeah. And uh, if it's a, a wonderfully red sunset, then it's a sort of reddish uh, color of the rice stock. I, I have to say, I was a complete skeptic <laughs> when it was happening. Welcome to and, the club. Yeah, so were many people. I saw oh, what are they doing, you know. And, I then saw one of these fast forward things of it being, as I was nursing my small son in the middle of the night, the very next day I took him there and I was, I was completely entranced and fell in love with this, as did so many people, didn't they? Seeing is believing. Yeah, and I wondered though, you, you were very busy at the time. <laughs> I Did you actually get time to enjoy it? Oh, yes. I mean, oh. I was there sometimes like 15 or 18 hours a day. I was showing people the building and going around with them and enjoying things. I was also cutting newspaper clippings for the, 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 our press portfolio, as it were, to document every... I mean, I'm a historian. I document things mm -hmm. as, as things go along, and we were doing all these things at the same time. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. I mean, of course, it's gone. It's 19 years ago now. Uh, I still get handshakes. People notice me on the street. And, I don't, and not, only even, mm -hmm. not only in Berlin, uh, for having uh, come up with the idea. And, um, and I was there all the time. I'm still, Krista, we're, we're still friends. We, we talk with each other every once in a Jean -Claude while. Jean-Claude is sadly... Jean-Claude died, uh, sadly, in four and a half years ago. It's, uh, it was a tragedy. But Krista was soldiering on, as it were, uh, working on other projects. Uh, to answer a question which I wasn't asked, is about how these things get financed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was my and, next question. Uh, you and, read my mind. Uh, uh, yeah. I was sort of thinking about that. And of course, it was all done by Christo selling his preparatory drawings. Christo and Jean-Claude, so all the drawings up front. After the project is done, there are no more drawings made. 
So, uh, so, but these works sell for many, many thousands of dollars, uh -huh. even tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they bring in the money which pays for the laborers and the material and the mm -hmm. scaffolding and everything else that's involved, including his travels. That's all paid for that way, not the posters, not the little gimmicks and, and the material which you just showed mm -hmm. is a present. So anybody who just asked for some, a piece of material, yeah, they got I one. I know, I did, uh, uh, yeah. It, all, yeah. You, all you had to do was ask for it. Christo was, did that originally to stop people from actually cutting it out. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good it's idea. A, it's, I mean, a, it's a very preventive me message and everybody is enthralled and you even have a piece of it. So. Well, I, I, I was actually um, making a TV program and they, they, I got a little surprise for you. Extraordinary, it was an extraordinary time, which I remember very well because my first ever television show as a presenter was about the rap Freistag. And you won't remember this because you made hundreds of interviews at the time. But one of them was with a rather nervous Deutsche Welle presenter in, it has to be said, a big suit. Now, you live in Berlin. Um, how do you think it's done for the image of the Germany and the Germans? I know that there have been interesting aspects of it in the American press and in the French press. The French have been very good about it. The British have been re less than pleasant about it. They've been somewhat, they've been sarcastic. And the Americans have had uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, and I don't know how the other nations have reacted because I haven't seen the TV. And of course, I'm waiting for the, the newspaper articles to come in. Very quickly, would you do it all again? Oh, certainly. Michael Cullen, thank you very much. There we were. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> there we were. So you, we've you. met. Yeah, we have met. I didn't want to say before the programme. Very but, good. Uh, I was, as, as, as I say, this, that was actually my very first television programme. You weren't to know this. You were, you were going from one interview to the next to the next. This shouldn't be our last. Yeah. OK. <laughs> you were mentioning the Brits were sarcastic. Yes. The French loved it. I said before, yes, I was quite cynical. It all turned around, though, didn't it? I mean, yes. people came to love it, didn't they? Well, it, it was, was an extraordinary happening. Well, the thing is that it, is, it, it, it <coughs> had its meaning for everybody. The part, Christo was very wise, who, and he resisted, he re resisted all kinds of attempts to in, infuse this project with some kind of extra meaning. It's, uh, there's an old line called WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get in the art world, it's what you see, and it's all there, and you can project anything you want on it. It's no, no different than a work of Mozart, of a, a piano concerto or a string quartet. You listen to it, you enjoy it, mm. or if you don't, perhaps you don't enjoy it. That's also possible. It goes away, and it's part of your memory, it's part of your feelings, but you don't have to embrace it, you don't have to love it, you don't have to profess you don't have no. to go to confession. It's all there for the happening, and you can take it or you can leave it. Yeah, and, and I mean, actually, you did this for love. You didn't profit from this. There was no, Except, unfortunately, a, not profit. No, no a, a small profit is on your lapel, if we can get the camera on that, because um, my guest is one of the few foreigners, actually, to have received the Bundesverdienstkreuz, the Federal Order of Merit, which is, <laughs> I know you, you have something else, but it's very small on your lapel. Well, there, this I is think. what... This uh, is the, the, the highest um, uh, award it's or says, whatever. It's one of the highest awards. In Germany. Uh, many Germans get them, very few foreigners, that's true. Um, and I got it from Johannes Rau, uh, who was then president in 2003. Um, I think I was the only non-German getting it that day. And... Uh, but it was, and there's a huge cross which one gets with a with a with a with a ribbon, and but that's only for the day that you get it. And maybe if the president says we are having a big major ball and you're invited and you must wear all your medals, then that's when you do it. Okay. But most, I mean, all, all the soldiers that you see walking around with these things batteries of metals. There are big things behind those things, but this is what you just wear on your suit. Okay. And this is the equivalent. It really changed um, 
attitude to Germany, didn't it? I think so. I think that the wrapping of the Reichstag created a happy mood. It made people feel less apprehensive about Germany. Germany's, Germans having fun. Yes. Germans yes. having, uh, almost like the last night of the proms, um, when you see the, the, the Londoners having all their dances and jigs at the, uh, at the last night of the proms, this was Germany having a good time. It was really, in a certain sense, uh, the f festival for reunification five years after the date. Mm. I mean, there wasn't anything like this before, uh, just being open and having a good time, and that they came day and night. They came at all times of the day. There were no plane seats to be gotten. There were no train seats to be gotten. After a few days, the word had spread around. 96% of all German adults knew something about the Reichstag. That's more than who knew about the neighbor who was the current president at the time. Yeah. It's, it's a terrible thing to say, but the media had a major effect on that, and, uh, and we had a wonderful experience. And as you say, from outside, it, it, I think that and the World Cup of 2006 changed attitudes about this country. Yes. Um, one of them, I'll move on to it actually, the, the, it, it, we have this questionnaire and you answered a couple of things and, and you said the best kept secret in Germany, um, it, you said actually is the one I don't know, but uh, you, <laughs> <laughs> you also said is the fact that there is a lot of humour, the, the, there's this cliche the Germans don't have a sense of humour, they're serious, it's rubbish isn't it, they do have a sense of humour. That's wonderful, poetry and literature and music, all kinds of things with a lot of humour, which I enjoy. Mm, yeah, and one of the great examples of this is the German comedian who's your favourite, I believe, Lorio, who I, I know is my guest favourite, humorist, here's more about one of the greats of German comedy. And I've just heard you actually knew the man himself. Yes, yes, he lived yes. in the same street. He lived in my street for many years, yeah. towards the end of his life. And um, we exchanged pleasantries on the street every once in a while. Uh, and uh, a couple of his very closest friends are uh, friends of mine. And uh, I will make sure that uh, one of them sees this uh, <laughs> uh, when oh, it's uh, broadcast. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, it, I, he... As it said in the piece, he, he sort of played on cliches and things about life. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple. We've, we've dispelled the cliche about humour. OK. OK. Yes. Are the Germans abrupt? People say they're abrupt and, you know, sort of serious. I mean, I always think it's, it's two things. The language is a bit hard sounding. Mm -hmm. And that I find the Germans very honest. But I don't know what you think. Well, I don't. I wouldn't make remarks about them being honest or dishonest. I think they're like everybody else. There are some who are and some who aren't. Well, sure. And yeah, that's the, number one. Uh, the second thing is about whether they're abrupt. Um, sometimes they are. Sometimes they're relatively abrasive. Uh, on the other hand, I have many, many friends who are the opposite of abrasive, being abrasive. They're quite cozy and pleasant and funny and we get along to we laugh a lot yeah i have but i know that i have many people i know many people who don't laugh at all yeah. and i'm so, i'm sorry for them yeah i know you like their what the germans call their diskussionskultur they're sort of they do like to discuss things. That is, I think, a fair one. I think that's a fair one, and I think that's a and very you positive like one. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I think that's uh, very important um, in a city like Berlin, which is full of competing ideas and uh, uh, antagonistic uh, ideas about how the city should go forward, uh, that they discuss these things and out front before they make terrible mistakes. I mean, they still do make terrible mistakes. They have. Did they? Did they make a mistake about the Berlin Wall? Because I know you were on a commission um, after the wall came down of where it should remain, and I, I hear from people who visit, where is it? I can't find it. I want to see where it was. Our commission suggested that many more segments of the wall remain standing. And the 
powers that be rejected some of those sites for political or uh, urbanistic reasons. At any rate, only four or five things are really up there. Uh, I would have said 10 would have been much, much better. And, um, but they didn't accept all my... Our, it's not only me, but uh, we had a few people on the board and uh, on the commission, and we made suggestions. They weren't always followed. And, uh, and one of the, if you like, one of the famous bits to outsiders yes. is the East Side Gallery, which has got um, uh, yes. paintings on it. But you're not a fan of that. I'm not a great fan no. of that, but because that's, it's really working on, a, on an emotional basis about the wall and what it meant, and not about the art which is on it. I don't think the art is very, very good. It'll be there for many, many years as, a, as an expression of the times uh, Berlin went through, but it's not for me, if, if it were by itself, if most of those works stood by themselves, they wouldn't stand by themselves. Mm. Okay. Um, you, we talked about the discussions culture, or you like discussion, so I want to ask you, we're nearing the end, uh, uh, but you've been here 50 years, I know you've retained your American passport, you choose to have an American passport, but do you think you're perhaps more German than American now? No, <laughs> I don't, I think I'm probably, let's put it like this, uh, a very famous American lawyer came to Germany in the 30s uh, to follow some trials here, and he was asked how good his French and German was, and he said, well, in France, my German is good, and in Germany, my French is good. I think that the Americans look at me and say, well, he's taken a lot of German, Germanists on, and the, the Germans look at me and say, well, he's still pretty American. So I think it's a matter of who's looking at me and who's talking with me, uh, who t decides whether I'm more one or the other. I um, think that I have retained a lot of American characteristics and probably have taken on a few German characters. Uh, and you're, you're staying here? You're not going, going back I'm to here for the duration, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, they say history repeats itself, uh, um, and, and you're a historian, so I did want to... We've had, this year, we've had the European elections, and there's lots of talk about Europe. What came out of the European elections, many things, but one of the main things was the sharp rise of anti-immigration parties. I mean, do you see... Looking into your crystal ball, I ask you finally, you know, do you, do you see that getting a real problem here in Europe? I think it'll be around for a long time. There is nationalism still here. And it's not over, it hasn't been overcome by all the various mechanisms, including a common currency. And even certain countries like Great Britain are not going along with the uh, common currency. It'll be here for a while. I think it'll always be something which comes up and goes down, depending upon the economies and, yeah. and various politicians. It's something to be, you have to keep fighting it. It's like, it's like a common cold. It'll come back and it'll not go away completely. But uh, you can live with it. And um, mm. it's really more important that the people who want to come here. Today, there's a very good article about the fact that Germany is so, the European, Europe is so attractive to thousands or millions of people outside of Europe okay. that they want to come here. And the, the fact that it is attractive is its problem. Well, I'll have to cut you off there, Michael Cullen. It's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you for watching. This man is a, is a history book in himself <laughs> <laughs> and has written the definitive book on the Reichstag. Look it up, Michael S. Cullen. Thank you very much for being with us today on Insight Germany. Bye-bye. <laughs>